Hello, this is Dr. Anju Singh, and today we are going to cover exercise 20, the structure and function of brain from Allen and Harper, uh, sixth edition lab manual for anatomy and physiology. So uh, basically the human brain is where um, all the information from our body is uh, integrated, collected, cataloged. Um, it coordinates all the variety of the incredibly possible um, processes that we experience in our life. There is no computer currently available that can um, function like the human brain. Uh, this is amongst one of the largest organs in the human body. It is responsible for our memory. It is responsible for our intellect, our ideas, our, our behavior. Um, as I said, it catalogs all the information we have perceived uh, through the sensory input. It integrates that information with previously acquired and uh, cataloged information. It records all of this and it produces actions um, based on the result of uh, this information synthesis. The brain, like any other organ in the body, is very well protected within the skull, the cranial cavity. And during development um, as a fetus, the brain and the skull grow simultaneously. So the skull actually is a mirror image of the brain because it literally grows very, very closely. I don't want to use the word attached, but it literally mirrors the brain because it grows alongside it. The brain is mainly made up of four regions, the uh, cerebellum, the diencephalon, the cerebrum and the brain stem. So if you go up from the spinal cord, the first part we see here is the brain stem. The, br the brain stem consists of three parts, the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. Uh, the cerebellum lies posterior to the midbrain and inferior to the cerebrum. Uh, the diencephalon consists of the thalamus, the epithalamus, the hypothalamus, the central part, that is the diencephalon. And this outer part, that's the cerebrum. So these are the four parts of the human brain. The, di uh, the, uh, the medulla oblongata, which is immediately superior to the spinal cord. This is like uh, the most vital part of the brain because it houses the respiratory center and the cardiovascular center. So this controls breathing and heartbeat, and therefore it is so vital. Um, it controls a blood pressure, uh, reflexes, and other reflex centers in the medulla oblongata for coughing, vomiting, sneezing, and stuff. So any brain injury, like swelling in the brain or pressure in the brain, tends to push the medulla oblongata into the um, foramen magnum, which causes um, uh, death in patients. Usually when we hear of people dying of uh, head injury, it's because the injury itself causes swelling of the brain and the brain, uh, the cranial cavity being a closed cavity uh, floating in the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, what it tends to do as the brain swells, it tends to push down into the uh, foramen magnum and that causes pressure on the medulla oblongata which then um, causes different kind of abnormal breathing patterns known as biotic breathing or chimes breathing. And these are signs that the patient is, we call it the patient is coning because the cone, this cone is being pushed into the foramen magnum. And that is a very, uh, a sign of poor prognosis in the patient if the pressure is not relieved immediately. The pons, uh, these are expanded structures that are located superior to the medulla oblongata and they're anterior to the cerebellum. Uh, they have respiratory centers that assist the medulla oblongata in controlling breathing. And again, remember, I said we have about 100 billion neurons and about 100 trillion connections. So everything is connected to everything and has an influence on anything. So some centers may be the primary center uh, to control certain things, but they will invariably be connected to and therefore receive information and impulses to modify their final uh, motor output, if you will. All right. So the pons also has some respiratory centers that influence the respiratory centers in the medulla oblongata. Uh, the pons also relay information from the diencephalon uh, to the cerebellum. All right. So there'll be connections between the diencephalon to the uh, uh, cerebellum that go through the pons. The midbrain uh, 
Um, this is a smaller area. It is, again, superior to the pons. It is inferior to the diencephalon. It consists of cerebral peduncles. I need you to make sure you listen carefully. We have a structure called cerebral peduncle and cerebellar peduncle. Right now, I'm just talking about the cerebral peduncle. All right. Um, and it also has another structure known as the corpora quadrigemini. Quadrigemini. Quadri means four. Gemini means twin. So they are basically four twin bodies. Uh, the cerebral peduncles, these are white fibers that connect the upper and lower brain areas. And the corpora quadrigemini are composed of two superior colliculi and two inferior colliculi. Uh, the superior colliculi, they have reflex, uh, uh, reflex centers that involve the eye movement, movement of the head, movement of the neck and uh, also visual stimulation. The inferior colliculi have reflex centers involving the auditory stimulation that result in um, head and trunk movements. Any um, abnormality or disease or damage to these colliculi can result in conditions like nystagmus, where there's involuntary abnormal rapid movement of the eye, or it can cause um, vertigo, where patients feel dizzy. Uh, and there are many, many different causes of nystagmus and many, many different causes of vertigo. This could be one of them. All right. And we will see those structures in the following figures. Just making sure I've covered everything here. So here's your spinal cord going up. You've got your medulla oblongata here. Uh, so medulla oblongata is here. This is the pons here, the midbrain. This is the cerebellum. And we'll go see that in detail in a little bit. This is the diencephalon here, consisting of the hypothalamus, the epithalamus, the pineal gland, which is part of the epithalamus, um, the uh, hypothalamus, the infundibulum, this little stalk here is the infundibulum, and then you have the pituitary gland with the anterior and posterior pituitary, deja vu, we've covered this in, uh, in endocrine system, and this is the cerebellum here. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, the, like a cadaver dissection of a brain showing a mid-statical section. So here's your spinal cord, the medulla oblongata, the uh, pons, uh, the midbrain here. This is the diencephalon, the cerebellum back here. This is the cerebrum on top. All right. Now, um, going slightly more into detail, uh, we talked about the corpora uh, quadrigemini, uh, that is the area that has a four nuclei. That is your number one, those two superior colliculi here responsible for visual stimulation and eye movement, um, and the head and neck movements, and then the inferior colliculi that involve reflexes involving the auditory stimuli resulting in head and trunk movements. So these are your superior inferior colliculi. Um, that make up your corpora quadrigemini. Then number two is the uh, cerebral peduncle. Cerebral peduncle, not cerebellar peduncle. We'll do that later. Uh, number three is the pons. Number four is the medulla oblongata. So we covered that. This is the inferior aspect of the brain. Again, a model showing the inferior view of the brain. This is a cross-section through the spinal cord as it ascends up. You can see why medulla oblongata gets its name. It's got this oblong layer, uh, oblong appearance. Now here we're seeing the middle cerebellar peduncle. All right. This is the middle cerebellar peduncle. Up here, these uh, bulges, these are your pons. And here is the midbrain. And these are all the cranial nerves coming out, and we'll do them a little later. So the fr right from here, from the midbrain down to the medulla oblongata, that's all your midbrain. Here they've sort of included the superior, co um, the spinal cord in the midbrain. The spinal cord is not part of the midbrain. From medulla oblongata to the midbrain is your brain stem. All right. Um, this is, again, an inferior view of a human brain, <clears throat> showing the lower end of the spinal cord down here. This is the medulla oblongata here. Um, these uh, bulges are the pons. This is showing the middle cerebellar peduncle on the side here. 
and that's the midbrain up there. All right, this would be the cerebellum on either side. This is the cerebrum. And then these yellow things are all the uh, cranial nerves coming out. So I'm not talking about the cerebellum. The cerebellum uh, is also known as a little brain. It is second in size to the cerebrum. Remember, we talked about the four parts of the brain. Cerebrum is the largest one. Cerebellum is the second in size. It is located inferior uh, uh, to the cerebrum, and it is posterior to the medulla and the uh, pons. The cerebellum has two hemispheres, known as the cerebral hemispheres, and they're connected um, in the center by the vermis. So number one here shows you the cerebellar hemispheres, and in the center is the vermis connecting the, the, the two hemispheres. Now, um, just like how we see sulci, gyri, and these, you know, the crevices, if you will, in the, cerebell, in the cerebrum, we also see them in the cerebellum. But if you notice how they're very tight and neatly packed, um, uh, and these are known as folia. Uh, so the cerebral folds, these are slender, and these are pleated gyri, also known as folia. <clears throat> and they look similar to like the pages in a book tightly packed together. The cerebellum is responsible for posture and balance, and it's also responsible for smooth, coordinated skeletal muscle movement. So patients who have cerebellar damage, for whatever reason, either because of trauma and injury, because of stroke, because of disease, for any reason, if the cerebellum is damaged, these patients will usually for some form of ataxia. Ataxia is abnormal walking, or they can have uh, movement disorders. Their movements are not smooth and coordinated. And there's a whole plethora of those kind of, um, of cerebellar conditions. Um, so cerebellar um, uh, abnormalities usually uh, manifest as loss of balance and loss of smooth coordinated movements, abnormal involuntary movements, um, are usually a sign of cerebellar damage. Um, now, if you take a mid-sagittal section through the cerebellum, as seen in this figure here, you will see the cerebellum too has um, uh, gray matter on the outside and white matter on the inside. But you see how the white matter looks almost like a tree? And because it looks like a tree, it's called arbor vitae. Arbor means like a tree. And these are your... Um, uh, white matter, these are your nerve uh, axons, and the gray ma matter is your nerve bodies. Um, and the cerebellum is connected to the brain stem through the superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles. All right, so again, make sure you know the difference between cerebellar peduncles and cerebral peduncles. Now, just making sure we've got everything covered here. So, this is the spinal cord here, your medulla oblongata, the pons. Uh, the the midbrain, the cerebral peduncles are up here. This is the fourth ventricle. It is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Here is the superior colliculi, uh, the inferior colliculi, those paired uh, nuclei in the quadrigemini area. And this is the tree-shaped arbor vitae, the white matter, surrounded by the gray matter of the cerebral cortex. Again, this is a mid-sagittal section showing uh, dissected through the uh, human brain. Uh, spinal cord, middle oblongata, pons, uh, the midbrain. These are all part of the brain stem. And then coming to the diencephalon. Uh, the diencephalon consists of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the epithalamus, and pineal body is the pineal gland is part of the epithalamus. Um, and this is the cerebrum, the cerebellum. You can see the um, tree-like structure, the inner white matter, and then the outer gray matter, not so clearly visible in this. And I apologize for the spelling error here. This is pineal body or pineal gland. The N is missing here. All right, so the, the, the diencephalon, the word diencephalon, di means two, cephalon means brain. Um, it is located in the brain's central area. As you can see, the diencephalon is pretty much central. It's not inferior like the uh, brain stem. It's not inferior and posterior like the cerebellum. It's um, just inferior to the cerebrum, okay, but it's a very centrally located area. It has three main regions, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, um, and the epithalamus. The thalamus uh, 
is composed of paired egg-shaped bodies that are centrally located in the diencephalon, and it makes up about 80% of uh, the thalamus, of the diencephalon. The each cerebral um, hemispheres, they contain about half of the thalamus. So when you take a mid-sagittal section, you're seeing half the thalamus here, and the half is in the other uh, section. And there is a small um, area called the intermediate mass that consists of a connecting bridge. Uh, the thalamus is the brain's grand central relay station. So you can, everything, as I said, everything's connected to everything. Um, but this is the area where um, uh, the principal, it's a principal relay station for all sensory fibers and some somatic fibers. So all the sensory fibers that are coming up from the spinal cord uh, invariably will relay at the thalamus at some point or the other. A lot of the motor fibers before they go down into the spinal cord invariably get an input from the thalamus. So this is like a grand central station uh, deciding what impulses are sent where. Um, so the thalamus is also responsible for filtering out unnecessary sensory information. So at any given time, we're receiving numerous, multiple sensory information. Um, and thalamus is responsible for deciding what gets filtered out and is not <coughs> excuse me, sent to the cerebrum and what is sent to the cerebrum. So thalamus is responsible for consciousness, for emotion, for learning, for memory. It plays in a very key role. Uh, the hypothalamus uh, is located below the thalamus. And we've sort of touched the hypothalamus earlier when we did the endocrine system. Um, uh, the, uh, the hypothalamus is like a quadrangular um, shaped area. It has many important uh, uh, nuclei. And these nuclei control many body functions in homeostasis. Remember, the hypothalamus is where a lot of your and, um, uh, neurotransmitters that are stored in the hypothalamus in the uh, in the pituitary gland are made here and they then are uh, secreted in response to different stimuli and they in effect control your uh, have are the higher center that control the production of all your hormones your stimulatory hormones your inhibitory hormones they're all produced here so the hypothalamus plays a very key role in regulating body functions and homeostasis some of these important functions include integrating and controlling the pituitary gland and hormonal functions, autonomic functions, emotion, behavior, uh, body temperature, eating, drinking. Um, and, and, and I hope you can now make the connection between everything we learned in the endocrine system and now how the brain controls it. So your, your vasoconstriction, your uh, epinephrine or epinephrine secretion, your... Um, um, uh, in the kidneys, uh, your glomerular filtration rate, um, you know, base, uh, all, everything, a lot of that is controlled through this. So again, in this figure, this is figure 20.4b, uh, a model sagittal section magnified through the uh, diencephalon. Uh, number five here shows the mammary gland. We'll talk about that in a minute. Number six is the pineal gland here, part of the epithalamus. This is the thalamus here. This is the intermediate mass of the thalamus. And here's your large or hypothalamus. And then your infundibulum going down to your pituitary gland. You have your anterior and pituitary glands here. And the optic chasm, that's your optic nerve. And the optic nerve from the right and left cross over. And that crossing over is the um, optic chiasm. Um, so the hypothalamus consists of the infundibulum, which is a stalk that connects um, the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. And we've done the detailed structure of this uh, of the infundibulum under the endocrine system. So I would recommend quickly review that and see that. Um, and it, uh, the hypothalamus consists of the mammary body. And the, ma uh, the mammary body, these are two small round masses that are located posterior to the infundibulum, and they are the relay station for uh, smell and taste reflexes. And finally, the epithalamus, uh, which is superior and posterior to the thalamus, it includes the pineal body or the pineal gland, and this is the small end, uh, the endocrine gland that secretes the hormone melatonin. And again, we've sort of touched upon that in the endocrine system.
moving on to the frontal section. This is a model showing a frontal section to the brain. And here I just want you to focus on the structure of the diencephalon, not everything. All right. So uh, the diencephalon has the thalamus here. We cannot see the epithalamus because it would be posterior to this. And therefore, we can only see the thalamus, these orange bodies here, and the hypothalamus, these bluish nuclei on either side of the third ventricle. This is the third ventricle. It has CSF in it. And these are the two lateral vent ventricles, like wind shapes. If you see a CT scan, the first most important, like a hallmark to be seen on a CT scan of a brain would be these wing-like projections. These are your lateral ventricles, all right? So again, focusing on just the diencephalon, uh, we have the thalamus and the hypothalamus here. The epithalamus is not visible because it would be posterior to this. Um, and just remember the relationship with the ventricles. This is the optic chiasm. So these would be the optic track, um, and they would cross over. Uh, and because this is a frontal section, the optic chiasm is probably a little bit posterior to this. So now we move on to the cerebrum. The cerebrum is made up of the right and left cerebral hemispheres. All right. And this is the largest and the most complex division of the brain. The cerebrum is a superior to and surrounds the diencephalon and part of the brainstem. The cerebrum is the center for all higher mental processes, such as intelligence, communication, learning, memory, reasoning, emotions. Um, this is basically what makes you, you. All right. Um, in addition, it interprets the sensory information um, and it initiates the skeletal muscle uh, contraction. So all your spinal reflexes uh, invariably, um, all the sensory neurons from your spinal cord come up to the cerebrum and relay at some area of the cerebral cortex where they're interpreted, processed, and you know information is shared between different areas uh, before a motor neuron is triggered and a motor response is initiated. All right. Um, as we've already said, if you look at a, a cross-section through the cerebrum, you'll see an outer gray matter that consists of neuron cell bodies, and the inner white matter consists of the um, axons of the nerves, the myelinated nerve fibers. So basically, there are three regions in the cerebrum. The cerebral cortex, uh, the, which is the gray matter, the white matter, and then it has deep basal nuclei, which are also grayish in color. The cerebral cortex, um, uh, this is the superficial gray matter area. It is exterior. Um, it is composed of nerve cell bodies and dendrites. Uh, this is uh, the area where uh, all the sensory information is integrated and the motor response and the motor output is initiated here. It is also involved with the emotion and intellectual processing. The basal nuclei, these are the areas of cerebral gray matter composed of paired nuclei. So they are clusters of neuron bodies in the central nervous system. And these are found deep within each cerebral hemisphere. The basal nuclei control autonomic um, sorry, they control the automatic skeletal muscle movement and are involved in the limbic system and the emotional brain. The cerebral white matter, which lies deep to the outer gray matter or the outer cortex, this is composed again mainly of the myelinated axons that give it the white appearance. And these axons are now organized into basically three different kinds of fiber tracks. Um, the tracks in the cerebrum are named according to their direction. So number one is the association track that transmit nerve impulses within the same hemisphere. So you see up here, you see the lines here you see, this is association. So this associates one part of the cerebral cortex to the other part. Um, as I said, almost every impulse that we perceive um, is capable of being um, uh, received, interpreted by almost any other part of the brain, and that is done by all of these different connections. So association fibers are the one that, um, uh, these are nerve impulses that connect within the same hemisphere. The commissural fibers are the ones that cross, they communicate between the two hemispheres. All right. They transmit nerve impulses between the two hemispheres. And then you have your projection fibers, the blue ones here. 
these are the projection fibers. These are either ascending tracks because they're ascending from the spinal cord up into the cerebral cortex, or they could be descending tracks that are taking motor impulses down from the cerebral cortex into the spinal cord. All right, so the projection fibers can be either ascending tracks or descending tracks. Um, the corpus callosum, that is a prominent section. And I will show you that in one of the other figures. Um, the corpus callosum cannot be seen in this frontal section. We'll have to see a um, sagittal section for that. All right. So the corpus callosum, that, this is a prominent commissural fiber track that is readily observable in a mid-sagittal section of the brain. It connects the two cerebral hemispheres. All right. Um, the fornices. Um, the fornis is, again, not visible in this figure, so I'm going to move on to the next figure. Just make sure we've covered everything here. Uh, you've got your spinal cord coming up here. This is your uh, brain stem, cerebellum. Your blue ones are your projection fibers. The green ones are your commissural fibers. And these red lines are your association fibers. This is your lateral ventricles, your third ventricle. All right. Um, so this is, uh, again, a model showing a, a frontal section through the brain. Uh, and we've already seen here, this is the orange one is the uh, thalamus, and these blue uh, are the nuclei in the hypothalamus. This is the third ventricle. Here's the fourth ventricle. So this is the fornix here. This is the white matter. It looks like a group of commissural fibers, but it's actually a track of arced association fibers. So these are arced association fibers connecting parts of the brain on the same side. They don't cross over to the other hemisphere. Um, and then the internal capsule here, this is the white matter. The internal capsule is a large group of projection fibers. Uh, they contain uh, both sensory and motor tracts that connect the cerebral cortex to the brainstem and to the spinal cord. All right. Um, and again, uh, this central thing, this is a longitudinal fissure in the cerebrum. And we'll go over these, and I'll go into details as we move along, but let's just identify all the structures. This is the outer gray matter, the cerebral cortex. This is the cerebral white matter. This is the corpus callosum. Um, that is your um, commissural fibers between the two hemispheres. This is a caudate nucleus, and we'll talk about that in a bit. In a bit. Um, the putamen, the globus pallidus. And these are all part of the basal nuclei or the deep gray matter. Remember we said the brain has uh, three main regions, the cerebral cortex, the white matter, all of this is the white matter, all the different projection, uh, the fibers, and then we have the basal nuclei, the deep basal nuclei. So these would be the deep basal nuclei, the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. All right, so this is a uh, dissected brain, frontal section through a dissected brain. Um, so here's the third ventricle. These are the lateral ventricles. Number one here is showing uh, the internal capsule, which are your projection fibers. Number two is the gray matter. Number three is the white matter. Number four is the corpus callosum, uh, the commissural fibers. Um, number five is your um, fornix. These are your association fibers. So they, although it appears as if they're connecting the two hemispheres, they actually don't. They just arced and they go back into the same hemisphere. And number six are your basal nuclei, your gray matter. All right, so now we're going to identify the um, surface features of the cerebrum, different parts of the cerebrum. The cerebrum is basically made up of four lobes, and these lobes are named after the cranial bones that they are adjacent to. So we have the frontal lobe. The red one here is the frontal lobe. The parietal lobe, the blue one here. The uh, occipital lobe, the green area here. Uh, uh, the temporal lobe, the purple one here. And there is a deeper lobe known as the insula, which is the golden area indicated in this figure, which lies deep. It is not visible until you dissect the superficial, like the part of the temporal lobe out in order to see it. So this lies uh, deep to the lateral um, cerebral fissure or sulcus. Uh, 
So the uh, cerebral cortex is made up of these grooves, if you will. These grooves are known as the sulci, and the bumps, the gray area out um, uh, on top of it, is known as the gyrus. And these sulci and gyri, basically what they do is they increase the surface area of the brain, so we're able to accommodate uh, a lot more cell bodies and neurons than we would otherwise on a smooth surface. Kind of sort of similar how we have microvilli in our intestine to increase the surface area for absorption of the food in an economical manner and have, you know, several hundreds of feet of surface area um, of our intestinal mucosal surface within um, a few feet of intestine. So similarly, if you were to flatten out you know, all these sulci and gyri, they would occupy a large amount of surface area. But for economy of space, these sulci and gyri um, help in um, allowing many more neurons to be present. Some of these sulci and gyri are very prominent and consistent between individuals. So uh, the central sulcus is the sulcus that separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The parieto occipital sulcus separates the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. Um, the, uh, the lateral cerebral sulcus separates the parietal and frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. And then we have the transverse fissure that separates the occipital lobe from the cerebellum. So these are some of the prominent features on the surface of the cerebrum. All right. So how we have the central sulcus here, then the gyri on each side, the one anterior to the central sulcus is known as the precentral gyrus, and the one posterior to that is known as the postcentral gyrus. Um, and the one fissure that's not uh, visible in this view is a longitudinal fissure, and that's the fissure that separates the two hemispheres. So that'll be more visible in a frontal section through the brain. So now to identify the parts of the brain in a uh, uh, model of the human brain, and here you can see the temporal lobe has been partially dissected off to expose the uh, insula. All right, so here, number one is the central sulcus. Right here, that's the central sulcus. So this will be the pre-central gyrus. Number six is the pre-central gyrus. And number uh, three, uh, where's the post-central gyrus? Number two will be the post-central gyrus. All right, so that's the central gyrus, pre-central gyrus, post-central gyrus. Uh, number three is your parietal lobe. Number four is the occipital lobe. Number five will be your transverse fissure that separates the occipital lobe from the cerebellum. Number nine here is the temporal lobe. Uh, number eight is your um, insula. Number seven is the frontal lobe. All right, now that we know like the outer structure of the cerebrum, uh, let's identify the areas by function. All right, so number four here shows uh, the um, central sulcus. So your pre-central gyrus, number three, is your primary motor area. All right, uh, and the post-sulcus gyrus, the blue area here, that is your primary somatosensory, your primary sensory area. Um, your primary somatosensory area, this is, you know, on the post-central uh, post gyrus. It receives nerve impulses of touch, proprioception, pain, temperature. So this is all your sensory, all your sensory neurons finally land up sending the information to this area, uh, the postcentral gyrus. Um, and then your uh, primary motor area in the precentral gyrus, this is where uh, most of your motor impulses are initiated. Uh, impulses sent to mainly the skeletal muscles. Um, and then we have the Broca's area. Number one here with the dotted line, that's the Broca's area. Uh, Broca's area, it is located superior and lateral to the, um, it is located superior to the lateral sulcus. This is the lateral sulcus here, so the Broca's area is just above the lateral sulcus. Um, and it is usually in the left hemisphere. It initiates impulses that result in speech. Um, so Broca's area alone is not, cannot be called a speech center because we do have other areas um, that are responsible for um, helping us understand sound, interpret sound, recognize spoke, spoken words and stuff. Um, but yes, it does initiate impulses that result in speech. So it is um, near the motor area, 
right? So um, the motor impulses that initiate speech are from the motor uh, from the Broca's area. Um, number two here is the primary gustatory area. Gustation means your um, taste, um, sense of taste. So uh, this this is located in the postcentral gyrus. It is just superior to the lateral sulcus over here, and this receives impulses from the taste buds. So remember, this is on your um, part of your sensory cortex. All right. Uh, so that's your gustatory area. Number eight here is your primary auditory area. So this is where all your auditory impulses, um, all the impulses from your ear are um, perceived here. So this is uh, located again on each temporal lobe. All right, so it is on each uh, temporal lobe and it receives impulses from the auditory receptors of the ear. Uh, number uh, six here is the occipital lobe, and this is your, where all the impulses from the retina, uh, the optic track and optic radiation, ultimately go and um, really on the posterior part of the occipital lobe. And then um, impulses, and, and, and the occipital lobe is connected with every other part of the brain. Um, there are about 900 tracks coming out just from the occipital lobe connecting to different parts of the brain. And if you think about it, everything you do is, is in some way, shape or form associated with what you see or um, everything you hear, touch, feel, invariably you probably turn your body or your head to look at it. So your ears, uh, your eyes are pretty much involved with everything we do. and. That could explain how why we have so many tracks connecting the occipital lobe with practically every other part of the brain. All right, um, and then number seven here is the Wernicke's area, which is located in the um, temporal and parietal lobes. It recognizes spoken words. It translates words into thoughts, and it also possibly helps us sound out new words or strange words we haven't heard. So you see how Wernicke's area also influences your speech, so to speak. Um, and therefore, sometimes, depending on what part of the brain is damaged uh, by stroke, some people are still able to speak. Their motor area is fine, but they're not able to say certain words. And that helps us understand exactly which area got damaged during a stroke. So speech or aphasia, uh, as it's called, can be impaired in different ways depending on which part of the brain was more affected. And certain um, parts, they know what they want to say. Uh, the thought is formed, the word is there in the head, but the motor function of actually saying the word out loud um, is impaired. So there are many different kind of speech impairments, if you will, as a result of damage to the brain. Um, and that's because uh, it is such a complex um, motor function. Speech is a very complex motor function. And so we have very um, uh, large association areas in the brain. So the, these are large areas that are adjacent to the corresponding sensory area, corresponding motor area. Um, this is where a lot of your integration of information takes place. Again, because they are communicating with each other. They integrate sensory information from the sensory cortex with past experiences, allowing us, for example, to identify objects by touch or to identify a sound as a music or as a speech or as noise. And then there's emotional uh, association between those sounds or those, uh, those uh, smells or those touch objects, the textures. So all of that we're able to do because of these uh, association areas. So now that we've done the structure and gotten some idea of the function of the brain, how do we um, you know, document the function of the brain? One of the ways we try to understand um, if the brain is functioning properly or not is by um, recording an EEG or an electroencephalogram. So basically, uh, the brain sends these action potentials. These are actually electrical currents. So these electrical currents can be picked up by wires and electrodes if attached to the head and then um, displayed on a screen or recorded on a paper, right? And, and that record of the brain waves, of the electrical activity going on inside the brain, is known as an electroencephalogram.
Um, and we won't go into the details of that, but just uh, there are four basic type of brain waves. Um, they are known as alpha, beta, theta, and delta brain waves. They differ by their frequency, which is the number of waves per second. They differ by their amplitude, and they differ by different conditions in wakefulness, in different stages of sleep, um, with different responses. And these are used for diagnosis clinically for conditions like epilepsy, for coma, to uh, know if a person is quote unquote brain dead, um, for numerous brain diseases, uh, also in dementia. Uh, they're very, very commonly used for sleep studies for patients with insomnia, hypersomnia, uh, nighttime terrors, um, so numerous sleep disorders. Um, uh, they study uh, EEGs. They can also monitor brain activity during, say, general anesthesia, um, again, for co comatose patient. Uh, demented patients in dementia, too, EEGs are used to diagnose um, patients with dementia and be able to uh, try to distinguish different kinds of dementia or see the rate of progression of a dementia. All right, so that's just the basic of uh, electroencephalograms. So now we come to how is the brain protected? Like every other organ in the body um, that is critical for life, um, the body is designed to protect it. Similarly, the brain too is uh, protected both physically and chemically. The cranial cavity uh, protects the brain physically. The cranial cavity has anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossae. And I took this figure from chapter nine from exercise nine in the lab manual because this figure was not there in this chapter, just to show the anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossae. Uh, the anterior cranial fossae, it supports the uh, frontal lobes of the cerebrum. The middle cranial fossa supports portion of the temporal and parietal lobes of the cerebrum, um, and also the diencephalon. The posterior cranial fossa supports portion of the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes of the cerebrum. It also supports the cerebellum and parts of the brainstem, all right? So these are your three different fossae. And if you remember looking at the skull, um, you could see how there was the wing of the sphenoid bone that separates the anterior fossa from the middle fossa. And then you have the process in the parietal bone um, that separates the middle fossa from the posterior fossa, all right? Now coming to the uh, chemical uh, protection of the brain offered by uh, the blood-brain barrier the meninges, and the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, we touched upon the blood-brain barrier briefly, even in the spinal cord, but we'll uh, see it again in a bit. All right, so here in this figure, we are seeing a frontal section. Um, this inlet here shows you it's a frontal section through a part of the parietal bone um, showing you the three different meninges. Now, the three meninges, as we know, they're the dura matter, arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. Same three meninges that surround the uh, brain also surround the spinal cord. So we've seen these when we did the chapter of the spinal cord. Dura matter is the outermost layer. The dura matter itself has two layers in it. The outermost layer of the dura matter is known as the periosteal layer, and it is tightly adherent to the inner surface of the cranial bone. And the um, meningeal layer, um, that is just exterior to the arachnoid matter, and it is then adherent to the uh, arachnoid matter. Now, there will, there is sometimes in certain places a, a, a split between these two layers of the dura matter, and that is known as the dural sinuses. And uh, eventually, these sinuses eventually drain all the venous blood from the brain. If you remember the anatomy of the brain, uh, initially when we did the cardiovascular, the circulatory system, we did the uh, circle of pillars in AP1. Uh, the ones who haven't yet done it, don't worry about it now. But you'll see a lot of arteries are going into the brain, but we don't see veins coming out of the brain a lot. That's because a lot of the venous circulation of the brain comes out through these sinuses, which are superficial. All right. The superior sagittal sinus is one of the largest sinuses. It is located superiorly um, to the longitudinal fissure, and which is one of the main dural sinuses. Um, and in when we did the skull, um, I did show you on the inner surface of the skull those little grooves. Sometimes some of those grooves are actually mirror images or impressions of the sinuses. All right. 
Uh, the double layer dura matter also extends deep into the longitudinal fissure in the center. So in this figure here, um, this here is the dura matter, and the outer layer of that would be your um, periosteal layer, and the inner layer would be the um, meningeal layer, and these two layers are uh, separated to form this sinus here. So this is the superior sagittal sinus going through, and the two layers come together and form the Fox cerebri um, and go in between into the longitudinal fissure, um, into the transverse fissure, forming the tentorium cerebri. So in the longitudinal fissure, it's called the Fox cerebri. When it goes through the transverse fissure, it's the tentorium cerebri. And when it goes between the cerebellar hemisphere, there it is known as the Fox cerebelli. All right. Um, and it just basically anchors everything in place. The arachnoid matter, which lies below the dura matter, um, it is a second meningeal layer. Um, and it has projections. Remember the spinal cord, it had those web-like projections. In the cranium too, it has projections, but these projections are more, um, uh, they are called villi, the arachnoid villi. Um, so these projections coming out here, these are your arachnoid villi. These are in the sub-arachnoid space because it's below the arachnoid, it's between the arachnoid and the pia matter. The pia matter is tightly adherent to the surface of the cerebrum, and the pia matter actually goes into every single sulci and gyri of the brain. The dura matter does not go into every single sulci and gyri. The dura matter stays uh, uh, just between the major fissures, uh, but the pia matter is tightly adherent to the outer surface of the cerebral cortex, and it um, wraps around every sulcus and gyri of the brain. All right. Um, the the space between the arachnoid and the pia matter is known as subarachnoid space. So you can imagine, in case of trauma, patients can get an epidural hematoma, a subdural hematoma, a subarachnoid hematoma, and and they can get a cerebral hematoma. So as you can imagine, the name tells you or it indicates where the blood um, or has collected. So just making sure I've got everything covered here. Right here on top is a layer of skin. That's a part of your scalp. Um, the, below that is the bone, the parietal bone that has been dissected. Below that is the dura mater. And although it's not very easy to distinguish, but the outer layer of the dura mater would be your periosteal layer. Uh, and below that is the arachnoid matter. Um, and then you have your uh, subarachnoid space and your arachnoid villi coming out into that. This is your superior sagittal sinus. Uh, the pia matter is tightly adhered to the cerebral cortex. And this would be the Fox cerebri going into the longitudinal fissure. This is a model of the same figure that we just saw previously, showing the skin on top with a little bit of adipose tissue below it. Uh, number six here is the parietal bone. Uh, number one here is the uh, subarachnoid space between the arachnoid and the pia matter. The red line is the pia matter. So you see how the red line is going all through every sulcus and gyri in the brain. Uh, this would be the gray area and this uh, the gray matter and this would be the white matter. So uh, number two is your arachnoid villus. Number three is the fox cerebri. That's the dura matter. The two layers of the dura matter coming together into the longitudinal fissure forming the fox matter. Number four is your white matter. Number five is the superior sagittal sinus. That's your venous drainage. Um, number six is the parietal bone. Number seven is the dura matter. Uh, number eight is the arachnoid matter. Number nine is the pia matter. And number 10 is the gray matter. All right. So as I've said before, the brain and the spinal cord um, is constantly bathed in the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and this cerebrospinal fluid provides it the oxygen, nutrients, and other vital chemicals that it needs. Um, the, the difference, although, although the cerebrospinal uh, fluid is different in its content, it is derived from the blood.
So it comes from uh, little blood vessels or capillaries known as the choroid plexus. So number two here in the figure is the choroid plexus. And it, uh, there's a very specific controlled uh, filtration slash, slash secretion happening that uh, produces the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, in the third ventricle here. Uh, so basically the ependymal cells, if you remember in the neuroglial tissue, we talked about the ependymal cells. Um, the uh, ependymal cells are the ones that help secrete the CSF into these four brain cavities known as the ventricles. So the four cavities are the lateral ventricle, that's number one here, the third ventricle, number six, and then the fourth ventricle, number four. All right, so blood comes out of the choroid plexus um, and uh, with the help of even diamond cells, it is, uh, we get CSF that is secreted into these ventricles. Now these ependymal cells, if you notice from the chapter where we saw them, uh, they have little cilia on them. And that cilia help the flow of CSF in one direction. So uh, the choroid plexus are present on the roof of all four ventricles. The lateral, the lateral ventricle uh, is located in each of the uh, cerebral hemispheres. Um, and they have a thin membrane known as the septum uh, uh, pellucidum that separates the two ventricles anteriorly. Now, the each arch lateral ventricle has an interventricular foramen that connects the two. All right, so this right here is your septum pellucidum, and the ventricular foramen isn't seen in this figure, um, but the two ventricles are connected by the interventricular foramen that opens medially into the third ventricle. The third ventricle is centrally or medially located between the pairs of masses of the thalamus, and we saw that in one of the previous figures to the frontal section. All right, so the thalamus is there. Um, and uh, it is narrower and smaller than the other ventricles. Now, connecting the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, uh, this is the fourth ventricle here, connecting this, uh, number three here, is uh, the cerebral aqueduct that connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is located between the pons and the cerebellum. Um, uh, one of the clinical applications is either because of a tumor or trauma or scarring as a result of meningitis or some other infection inflammation of the brain, many a times uh, this cerebral aqueduct can get blocked. If this cerebral aqueduct gets blocked, the CSF tends to accumulate here, backlogs and accumulates, and uh, the third ventricle becomes enlarged and it pushes and puts pressure on these parts of the brain. And that is what we call a hydrocephalus. Uh, if it happens in a young child whose brain is still developing and the sutures are not closed and the, brain, and the bones are still soft, the head actually enlarges in, uh, in hydrocephalus babies. If you've heard that condition, one of the treatments for that is to put a stent uh, to open the um, duct. And many a times there's usually a stent put that goes from the cranial cavity down into the peritoneum and the CSF is uh, taken out from there. All right. Um, so the, um, the CSF finally gets absorbed back into the blood. So it comes out of the blood through the choroid plexus. It circulates around um, and, and comes out and uh, uh, is finally absorbed back into the sinuses through the arachnoid villi. So the arachnoid villi's job is to put the CSF back into the blood. Also, there are two apertures in the fourth um, ventricle known as the lateral and median apertures. These are little openings that allow the CSF uh, to flow from the fourth ventricle into the subarachnoid space. And similarly, as it goes down into the spinal cord, the CSF comes out into the subarachnoid space and bathes the spinal cord. All right. And um, ultimately, it returns back into the blood by reabsorption through the arachnoid villi. All right. Um, again, most of it happens in the superior sagittal sinus, but to some amount it happens in all the sinuses in the brain.
So this here is a right lateral view of the brain and, this, and the ventricles have been superimposed here. So this is not a right sagittal section. This is a kind of sort of a 3D reconstruct, if you will, model trying to show the ventricles. So here, number eight, I had two lateral ventricles. And number nine here is the interventricular foramen that was not so well identified in the previous figure. And this foramen connects the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. So number 10 I is your third ventricle. And then you have uh, number 11, which is the, um, uh, the, the cerebral aqueduct that connects it to the fourth ventricle. So number 12 is the fourth ventricle. And this is your medial and lateral uh, apertures that are allowing the CSF to go out into the subarachnoid space. And a little bit of the CSF is now going down into the central canal of the spinal cord. All right, and, and, and ideally all of this, there would, be a, there would be a blue line here as well showing the uh, CSF in the subarachnoid space. I'm sorry, I clicked the mouse and jumped to this figure, but I think I did complete the previous figure. So um, here we have a mid-sagittal section of the brain and the spinal cord. So what we're seeing here um, is number 14 is showing the superior sagittal sinus, so that is the uh, venous blood uh, returning from the brain. Number 15 is your um, arachnoid villus that is doing the reabsorption of the cerebrospinal fluid and putting it back into the blood. Number 16 is the subarachnoid space that has the CSF in it. Number 17 is your uh, lateral ventricles. Number 18 is the choroid plexus uh, where the um, uh, CSF is, comes out from the blood. Number 19 is the third ventricle. Number 20 um, is the, the cerebral aqueduct. Number 21 is the fourth ventricle. And number 22 is the central canal in the spinal cord. All right, so here I hope you can see how it, uh, the CSF is produced here within the ventricles. It circulates and comes out into the subarachnoid space, and the brain is literally bathed in the CSF. Both the brain and the spinal cord are bathed in the CSF, and then the CSF is reabsorbed back into the venous blood. Um, uh, and goes back there. Um, these last few figures in the exercise are uh, supposed to be dissection of a sheep brain. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that, but um, just to identify different parts of this uh, of the sheep brain, here you have the frontal cortex, you have the right cerebral hemisphere, this is the left cerebral hemisphere, here's the parietal lobe, these are the little sulci, the dark lines, and the lighter area, those are the gyri. Uh, the central long line, that's your longitudinal fissure. Uh, way at the back here, that's the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. This is the cerebellum, so the two cerebellar hemispheres, and the central vermis that is connecting the two cerebellar hemispheres. Uh, and because this is a posterior view, right? Um, it says it's a dorsal view, but what we're seeing is um, in a human being, this would be a posterior view. Uh, so we're not able to see the brain stem really well over here. Just a little bit of the medulla oblongata is seen over here and the spinal cord at the bottom. Now this is showing uh, a ventral view or what in the human being would be more an anterior view. Uh, you can see the spinal cord um, at the bottom here. On top of that is the medulla oblongata. Uh, the pons. Now we haven't done all the cranial nerves, uh, but just to remember as a rule of thumb, all the cranial nerves are numbered from anterior to posterior. So the first cranial nerve in the human being uh, is the olfactory nerve. Um, and in this one, it's up here uh, in the sheep. This is the olfactory bulb. So that's the first cranial nerve. And then you have your optic chiasm. Your optic nerve is your second cranial nerve. Um, so after the optic nerve crosses, uh, it has mixed fibers, some from the right eye, some from the left eye. So this is known as an optic track. So this is showing the optic nerve, the optic chiasm where it crosses, and then the optic track behind that. This is the infundibulum that connects to the pituitary gland, which has been removed in this case. Here are the mammary bodies. This is the cerebral peduncle. And here are the pons. Um, this is the uh, fifth, the trigeminal nerve, 
it's called trigeminal because it's got three parts to it, and we'll get to that later. Uh, but that's the fifth nerve, and then the sixth nerve is the abducent nerve that supplies the eye. Um, but anyway, just making sure you can identify the different parts of the brain here. And this figure here is showing the posterior view of the midbrain structures of the sheep brain. So here's the cerebrum. Um, uh, this is the occipital lobe. So that is, again, the posterior view, if you will, the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. You see those two sets of twins. And then here's the cerebellum. So you can see it's slightly different from how it is in the human beings, but uh, still has pretty much the same structures, if you will. And finally, here we have a mid-sagittal section through the sheep's brain. Um, so here's the spinal cord coming up. We have the medulla oblongata, the pons. Here's the mammary body. This is the fourth ventricle in here. This is the cerebellum. This is the corpora quadrigemini, those four, the superior and inferior um, colliculi. Um, this is the cerebral cortex, the pineal body uh, at the epithalamus. This is the thalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus would be below here. Here's the mammary body, the optic chiasm. The pituitary gland is pretty big in a sheep's brain. This is the corpus callosum, that is the fibers, this uh, arc thing over here. These are your fibers that connect the left hemisphere and the right hemispheres. Uh, this is the lateral ventricle. Um, this is part of the fornix that comes in from the of the dura matter. Uh, sorry, the fornix. Um, these are your association fibers. I was uh, mixing it for a second with the uh, fox cerebri. It's not the fox cerebri. That's the fornix. All right. Again, these are figures from the um, exercise at the back of this uh, chapter. Um, at the end of the chapter, reviewing your knowledge, see if you can label these parts and more than just name the structure, um, tell us kind of sort of what they do. If you're able to name the parts and what they do, you should be good. All right, so I won't go into that. I'll let you do this exercise as preparation for the exam. Um, same thing for here. Uh, make sure you can identify all these structures and what they do. This is showing an image of an MRI and showing different structures here. And I, I challenge you to try and identify these structures here, too. You should be able to do that. It's pretty, um, you can take it from one of the figures in the chapter, and you should be able to identify these. Um, same thing here, showing the human brain, a transfer section to the human brain. And here the brain is still preserved in the cranial cavity. Um, so again, showing the different structures here. And I would encourage you to try and label all these. If you can tell what these structures are and know what they do, uh, you're in good shape. All right, and that brings us to the end of this exercise.